Another aspect of the analysis and the findings that will make your health-related question answerable relate to Bradford Hill's criteria of causation. I encourage you to go to the link at the bottom of this slide to read this article for yourself. But in the next several slides, I'll be sharing some quotes from this article to give you a gist of what it says. And what Bradford Hill does in this article is basically lay out a set of criteria that can either lend support to the idea that the relationship you find might be causal or take away from that and therefore make it unlikely that the relationship you found is causal. Just note that there's an entire field of study dedicated to causal inference and making causal claims based on observational data using new methods. These slides don't address any of those methods at all. And so what I really want you to take away from this is that if all of these things are true in your data, you still really can't make the claim that your findings are causal. However, if several of these things are absent from your findings, then chances are that the relationship you found, or maybe the relationship you didn't find, it's unlikely to be causal. The first criterion that Bradford Hill puts forward is that of strength. And I won't read through this entire quote, but basically his main argument is that the death rate in smokers is nine to 10 times higher than that of non-smokers. And the death rate in people who are heavy cigarette smokers is 20 to 30 times as great. Whereas if you look at the relationship between smoking and heart disease, it's only two times more than in smokers than in non-smokers. And you could imagine that there might be confounders that are impacting this relationship between smoking and lung cancer or smoking and death. But he says, to explain the pronounced excess of cancer of the lung in any other environmental terms requires some feature of life so intimately linked with cigarette smoking and with the amount of smoking that such a feature should be easily detectable. So what he's saying is that confounding here, for it to be true, the confounding variable would have to be so tightly linked to smoking that it would just be super obvious. And in the absence of such a super obvious feature, it must be true that smoking is linked and causes death and lung cancer uh, well beyond what's seen in non-smokers. So simply the strength of that relationship, the fact that it's nine to 10 times as much in smokers uh, and you know 20 to 30 times as much in heavy smokers, uh, this relationship must be causal because it's just so strong. Bradford Hill also cautions that strength is a relative concept and not an absolute one. So if you look at the cholera epidemic and look at the number of deaths that were seen in the polluted water of two of the companies that supplied the water, the death rate was actually only 71 deaths for every 10,000 houses that were supplied with water. However, when you compared it to the water coming from the Lambeth Company, which was located upstream uh, on the same river, so the water was not polluted, the death rate was uh, five deaths per 10,000 houses supplied. And so even though the actual numbers of people who were dying at the two companies supplying polluted water as compared to the other company, uh, the relative difference 14 times was what was impressive. And so it's the, the strength refers to the relative strength um, when you compare the group that's exposed versus the unexposed group and not to the absolute number of people who are experiencing the outcome. Although having a strong relationship supports the idea that a relationship might be causal, just note that a weak association might still be real. And so Bradford Hill notes that it's really easy to say that there is no cause and effect relationship possible when the relationship is weak. But he also points out that in the example of meningococcus, which we know causes meningitis, many people who are, ex are exposed to meningococcus actually never develop meningitis. So even if you find that the rate of development of meningitis among people exposed to meningococcus is relatively low, that doesn't establish necessarily that the relationship is not causal. Because we know for a fact biologically that the cause of meningitis is the meningococcus. The next criterion that Bradford Hill puts forward is that of consistency. And the example he gives 
is that of the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. And although we can't prove that smoking causes lung cancer, there have been 29 studies retrospectively and seven prospective studies that have all looked at this problem. And pretty much every study has found this association to be true. So the fact that the association is so consistent across multiple studies, in effect rules out the chance that there was a systematic error in the way people were doing their analyses that was resulting in this finding to be there. It's much more likely that this association is a true association simply because so many different types of people have looked at this and everyone has found the same thing. Another concept that Bradford Hill introduces is that of specificity. And he argues that if the association between someone's occupation and a specific type of disease is you know, specific to both that occupation and that specific type of disease, then it's more likely to be causal. So for example, if you found that individuals who are exposed to smoke at their work are more likely to die of lung cancer, but not more, any more likely to die of colon cancer, that would argue that the relationship between the type of work and the exposure to smoking and lung cancer is more likely to be causal. And he does mention that one of the critiques of the association between smoking and lung cancer has been the fact that smoking causes many problems. So it's not just lung cancer. And in, in, fact, in fact, the death rate of smokers is higher than the death rate of non-smokers from many different things, not just from lung cancer. And so it lacks specificity. Another one of the concepts that we already addressed earlier is the concept of temporality. So we mentioned earlier that if you were looking at the relationship between coffee and heart disease, you'd want to make sure that when you ask people about their coffee use, it was about previous coffee use. And when you ask people about their development of heart disease, it was kind of more recent development of heart disease such that at least you can make an argument for temporality, that the coffee exposure happened before the development of heart disease. Another idea introduced by Bradford Hill that lends support to the idea of causality is that of a biological gradient. So if moderate smoking raises your risk of death by 10 times, but heavy smoking raises your risk of death by 20 times, this is a biological gradient. So there's a dose effect relationship such that the more you smoke, the more likely it is that you would die. Imagine if this were not true. Imagine if you found that moderate smoking was associated with 20 times higher risk of death, but heavy smoking actually reduced that risk to only 10 times higher risk of death. That would certainly weaken the argument that smoking results in death simply because it appears to have a protective effect when you get to higher doses. It would also be nice if the relationship you find is biologically plausible. So if you're looking at an exposure and an outcome that are completely unrelated, you know, people are gonna be much less likely to believe you when you say that you think this exposure causes this outcome. However, Bradford Hill says that he thinks we really can't demand plausibility because Biological knowledge changes, and so what might be considered implausible now might be plausible when we have further biological knowledge in the future. So while it would be good for there to be plausibility between, you know, to establish a relationship between an exposure and an outcome, it's not necessarily a requirement because we might learn more in the future that makes this relationship more plausible when we know more. On the other hand, Bradford Hill argues that our findings should be coherent with what is known. So if we find something that completely contradicts what we know about biology, physics, or natural history of disease, then we probably shouldn't take those findings as seriously uh, as something that is more coherent with what we already know. Even when we have observational data, occasionally that data is collected in circumstances that resemble an experiment, which we might refer to as a natural experiment, that let us try to look at causation. So imagine that you are collecting quality measures for a floor on the hospital and halfway through your data collection, the hospital introduces a new policy that results in the way care is delivered to those patients on that floor. It may be possible for you to start to look at 
whether that policy impacted the quality of care simply because that policy was introduced halfway through your data collection, even though that wasn't your original intent. The last example that Bradford Hill gives is that of analogy. And so if you consider that women who take thalidomide have children who have um, malformed limbs, if you were to run into a, another situation in the future where children were being born with malformed limbs after exposure to a different type of drug, you're going to be more likely to be concerned that that is a causal link, uh, simply because we already have an analogy for another situation in which that same problem happened in the context of a medication being given. After considering all those criteria, Bradford Hill has this advice to give. He was asked to answer the question of whether workers exposed to machines that clean raw cotton and produce a lot of dust have an experience of illness that's any different from other workers in those same mills that weren't exposed to that dust. And so he looked at people between the age of 30 and 60 and found that they were three times more likely to suffer from respiratory issues and no more likely to suffer from non-respiratory issues as compared to the workers who are not exposed to that same dust. And he tried stratifying his analysis by, you know, separately for men and women, uh, for a dozen different age groups. And no matter what he did, after looking at 36 different tables, everywhere he found this relationship to be true. And nowhere did he think to apply a statistical test. So the idea is, is that even before you apply a statistical test, there are many ways to visually look for relationships. Uh, or even just to look at uh, counts of numbers to establish relationships. And so the statistical set, the test should not be the primary way to answer that question. Hopefully it's obvious from the data when you look at these relationships. And the statistical test is kind of another measure of, or another way of providing support to your hypothesis.